Well, we've had a phenomenal Kingdom Rise weekend, and it's not done. It finishes today. It is not just Friday night, Saturday night. I always chose, I always knew it would filter over into Sunday. And so this will actually conclude our Kingdom Rise weekend. We've already had people, three people get born again. We've had the gifts of the Spirit in operation through a word of knowledge. And then we've had, we laid hands on the sick of people last night. And if, if we laid hands on you and there's a change in your body, would you raise your hand right now? Look at that. Go ahead and just stand to your feet. We laid hands on you last night and there was change in your body. Praise the Lord. You hear what I'm saying? So we see here that God's touch changed. He's done something in your body um, because the Bible says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And because we're in Christ, we are positioned to have that authority over our skin suit so that it would get in alignment. Now, I cannot make my skin suit immortal, meaning it can't be immortality. That only comes when the trumpet blows, <laughs> right? And we'll put on immortality. At that point, we'll get our glorified bodies but, it, but we can make it stay in alignment so that it's healthy and it doesn't hinder us from accomplishing God's purpose. Amen? All right. So we've taken some time to outline who we are in Christ. We're actually saying positions, please. Right? We're asking uh, people to get in their position, and that position specifically is being in Christ. <clears throat> is being in Christ. Now, a lot of times when we say in Christ, you know, it, it, I mean, really in the church, it just kind of becomes a cliche, a statement. Too often we can say certain truths in God's word, and we've heard it so many times, we just like gloss over it without stopping long enough to reflect on what that means. I mean, think about it just for a moment. Reflect. What does it mean that you were purchased by the blood of Jesus and brought out of the domain of darkness out of your sin, your guilt, your shame, and brought into the marvelous kingdom of God where you are made free. Can we reflect for a moment of, what it, of that day when we came into the kingdom of God and realized that the weight of sin was lifted off of us? This weekend, three people realized that just this weekend. But some of you, you got to go back. I got to go back to 1979 where I have to think about that day when I know I was changed and that it was pulled off. Now, I didn't have tons of junk because I hadn't lived long enough. But when I started living fleshly for a season before, I, between, I don't know, probably 14 to 21, uh, you know, uh, I, there was condemnation in my life because I was being convicted by the Holy Ghost to not do certain things, but I was doing them anyway. You know, and the church wasn't condemning me. My lifestyle was condemning me. You know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, they just preach a message of condemnation. No, you condemn yourself when you live a lifestyle outside of God. So when someone's preaching the life of God and it doesn't line up with your life, conviction's going to show up and then you're going to feel condemned because you're violating Romans 8. Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who are aware in Christ. But again, we said this last night, the best way to explain staying in Christ is when you're staying clothed, okay? You're clothed in him. So you don't get to see all me because I'm wearing clothes. And so I'm clothed in righteousness. I have the full armor of God on. But if I was to take all my clothes off right now, then I would be naked and exposed, and that's what happens when we come out of our position of in Christ, we become naked and exposed, and, and we basically put ourselves back on the devil's territory of dominion, where he can begin to rule in our lives, where he has no right anymore to rule in our lives. But I choose to stay in a fixed position in Christ. When I was born again, he raised me up and seated me in heavenly places where? In the king, in Christ. Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, which is the king. It's the anointed one in his anointing. But that's based, that is entirely speaking of the anointing of a king. Yeah. And we know that Jesus is a king. For Pilate said himself in John chapter 18, starting in verse 33, he said, are you the king of the Jews? Now he was a governor. So he was a government man. And he's like, I'm talking to another government guy. And Jesus said, did somebody tell you about me or did you learn this on your own? What's he saying? He's saying, did somebody let you know about my kingship? 
Pilate fires back and he says, look, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your people and your chief priest has handed you over to me. What have you done? Then Jesus says this. He doesn't deny it. He says, my kingdom yeah. is not of this world. Now, that doesn't mean it's not in it. It means it doesn't operate. How do we know that? Because of the next statement he makes. My kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my servants would not let me be handed over to the Jews. Because, see, worldly kingdoms defend their kings from invading nations or invading people groups. But he says, my kingdom doesn't operate that way. It's different. In fact, what they didn't understand is, I'm the king of a kingdom that I am fixing, I'm about to, so don't use my southern slang, I'm about to <laughs> invite others to come to my kingdom. And when they come, they will become citizens that are born of it, but their positions, all of them, will not be subjects, but kings. They'll all be kings. They'll all be kings. Because he's the king of? Who are those kings? You are. When are you those kings? When was Jesus king? The day he was born in the earth. Now, he's always been a ruler because he's been with his father. But when he put on the skin suit, wrapped in flesh, he walked in the dominion or kingship that the first Adam fell from. Because the wise men came not seeking a new religion. Well, you know, we've been over here in the east and we've been worshiping all kind of other gods and we come to find out there's a new God here in town and we want to know his religion so we can follow it. No, the wise men came, came to the king of Israel. His name was Herod. And he says, we've come to find the child that was born a king. Herod's obviously got a problem because it wasn't in his house. It threatened his throne. So he, you know, through his manipulation and deception, said, go find out what this kid is so I can come and worship him too. Now, when we say worship, that wasn't singing songs. They didn't bring the praise band. No, when he said worship, it means this. Let me come and do what you're going to do because that's what they did when they came in and saw the child who was about two years old and they brought their gifts. They bowed down because this is what you do to kings and presented their gifts before the king. Hallelujah. Can you imagine Joseph and Mary when this entourage of men that came from the east said, we saw the child star the day he was born. It took us about two years to get here. We've been traveling just to meet the king. I said, just to meet the king. So Jesus was born a king. He said, my kingdom's not of this realm. And Pilate says, so you are a king. He says, you say correctly that I am a king. What do they put upon his cross? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. He was tried on the public scale, not as a religious fanatic, but as a man that declared himself king and in Roman occupied territory, that's treason. Okay. Hallelujah. You got to get rid of your traditional thinking about Jesus. Jesus is Savior. He saved us because we needed saving. But he's always been king. He's always been ruler. If Adam had never eaten the fruit, Jesus would still be Lord. Supreme in authority. But because Adam did eat the fruit, he had to become our Savior because saving was now necessary. Why did we need to be saved? Because God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule. From the beginning of Genesis, he always wanted and was demanding a created being called humanity that they would rule like he does. And when Adam fell from his rulership, came out of his dominion, gave it over to an anointed cherub that had been cast out of the realm of heaven because he rebelled against God's throne, wanted to overthrow his government, much like what you see is happening with Russia right now. 
The enemy, the devil went up. We call him the bright morning star. He's known as Lucifer in the King James Version. They give him that name, and he went up to try to take over the throne of God. Thrones are in kingdoms, not in religions. And this is why we love a different gospel about Jesus, because when we only hear that Jesus saved us, it doesn't have to change us. You say, wait a minute now, you can't be saved unless you're changed. Again, the change is only what he did and you do nothing still. We love that Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave, that his blood was paid, and that if we call on his name, we're saved. But that's just it. We're saying, Lord, save me, but saving is not what gets you saved. It's your Lord. Yeah. Lord is supreme in authority. And we don't take into account his lordship. We just want the get out of hell free card. Because when I die, I don't want to go to hell. And it's the gospel that people are preaching about Jesus, that where are you going to go when you die? You know what? They're saying that in Hinduism. They're saying that in Islam. They're saying that in Buddhism. Where are you going to go when you die? And now it has made itself into the Christian church. Now, where are you going to go when you die? Sure, you'll go to heaven. The Bible says if you're born again, to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. No one here is preaching that you're not going to heaven. But that's not the goal of God. The goal of God is not to take you out of earth to be with him. The goal of God is to put himself back in man. When he created Adam in the beginning, he didn't say, let me make man in our image according to our likeness. I'm going to pull a woman out of him to be Adam and Eve. And you know what? They're going to walk here for a couple of days. But honestly, I just really want them in heaven. Well, if you want them in heaven, why didn't he just keep them in heaven? Why did he make planet earth in the first place? And then if you read your Bible, why is a new Jerusalem when we get a new heaven and a new earth? Which, why are we getting a new earth anyway? If heaven's the only thing that matters. Now, the reason why most Christians believe this is because they don't read their Bible. They only believe what the guy or lady from the pulpit is saying to them. Well, you don't have to believe anything I say because I'm saying it today or any other day. In fact, you shouldn't. You should believe it because you search the scripture yourself to see it so. And I can guarantee you, if you'll search it, you'll find it. Because here's the thing. When we speak truth, the Holy Ghost on the inside is the one that's going to say, yep, that's it. So honestly, it's the Holy Spirit teaching you. It just has my voice attached to it when he says, yep, that's it. Yeah. Yep, that's it. And for many of you, he starts bringing up other scriptures. Yeah. See, when you're well-versed in scripture, when I make the statement that Jesus did not die on the cross and raised from the dead just so that you would escape hell and go to heaven. Because when you read scripture, all of a sudden your mind would start saying, well, in the beginning he came down to man. He breathed into his nostrils and he came down in the cool of the day. And when man sinned, he still came down because he came down, you know, and spoke to Moses uh, or to, to Noah. He came down and spoke to Moses in fire, a fiery bush. He came down to the nation of Israel when he delivered them from Egypt. He came down in a pillar of cloud and came down in a, a pillar of fire by night. He came down on the prophets and began to speak. He came down into the temple and filled the glory of God. He came down all the time. And then Emmanuel is God with us. He's always coming down. And in the end, when he creates a new heaven and a new earth, the millennial reign, he'll come down and be on the planet with us. After the catching away of the church. And then when he cast the devil into the lake of fire, which is the second death, along with a uh, false prophet and the beast and everyone who never called on the name of Jesus as Lord, then he'll create a new heaven and a new earth. And the holy city of Jerusalem will come down out of heaven to the earth. And God the Father himself will show up on this planet. Now, does that mean the rest of his creation means nothing? No, not saying that. Galaxies will still be there. Heaven will still exist. I'm sure that we're going to have opportunities to travel everywhere. Because, you know, when you're in God and in his glory, 
You can translate anywhere on assignment. <laughs> Paul said, I knew a man in body or out of body, I do not know, called up to the third heaven. Hallelujah. I believe we'll get called up on assignment in places. Amen. But make no mistake about it. When it's time to come home to Jerusalem, it'd be right here on this planet. <laughs> All right. Amen. I've said enough already. We can probably close. Amen. Amen. The king's coming. I said the king's coming. I said the king's coming. He's coming for his kings. Because when the king returns this time, he's not coming for the lost. He's not coming for the lost. See, Jesus came the first time to lay down his life because all of us were lost. The second time, he'll shout, a trumpet will blow, and with a shout, we'll be called up with him. Who? His kids. It's time to get in now. Not just get in, stay in. Because you need to learn this kingdom because you're not going to go to a Savior that's going to say, well, what do you want to do today? That's not how the kingdom operates. You'll be going up to him, bowing down, laying prostrate before the Lord, saying, Lord, what do you want me to do now? Oh, you'll be standing before love itself. And you'll be in awe with his power, with his power, with his glory, with his love. It will be amazing. You'll be so glad that you put your flesh down. And you walk by the Spirit on this planet. And more and more will be revealed of how we'll operate in his heavenly kingdom that will manifest right back on earth. Seven years later, we'll show up to a world that's in absolute chaos. And it's not in chaos because of the devil. It's in chaos because of the wrath of God. The tribulation period is not to glorify the devil. It's one of the greatest mercies of God showing humanity. You want government without me? You want a place without my presence? This is the closest it gets to the lake of fire without getting there. And they can still repent. But man, when you get cast into the lake of fire, repentance is over. Although you will have had a serious change of thinking. Oh, everyone who's cast into the lake of fire has a serious change of thinking. How do we know this? Because Jesus tells us. He said, now listen, there was a guy that was a ruler, a rich man, and he had this beggar by the name of Lazarus right by his table, and he just wanted the crumbs to fall off as the dogs would lick his sword. Well, both the rich man and Lazarus died. Lazarus woke up and found himself in Abraham's bosom. This is before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and he was being comforted by a Abraham. But... This rich man could look over in the grave and see Lazarus there with Abraham. And he called out to Abraham, knowing his name, though he existed thousands of years before, and would begin to say, can you send Lazarus over? I'm in such torment. If he could just put a little water on my tongue, something, just something to remind me of what it's not like to be in this torment. And Abraham said, now look, man, it ain't going to happen. We cannot get to you. There is this gulfy fix between us. We died in righteousness awaiting for the lordship of Jesus Christ. You died in your selfish desires, never thinking of anyone else but yourself. He says, oh my gosh, I got it all wrong. Please send Lazarus back because I got five brothers. They're worse than I am. And Abraham says, let me tell you something, son. If they do not believe the law and the prophets, they're not going to believe somebody even if they're raised from the dead. So the word is enough. The word was enough to get us right. So they'll have a change in thinking quick in the lake of fire. All who have gone on to be without the Lord, they know right now he's Lord. And their day's coming that they'll see him. And that day is such a sad day. Why is it sad? Because we, it tells us, man, I'm not even on my sermon, but this is good. He says that in the end, the last thing that he deals with is death itself. 
And he'll call out from heaven and say, grave, give up the dead. And grave will give up the dead. Now, what does that mean? That means they will all that were dead without Christ will show up in heaven. Because the Father has not yet created a new heaven and a new earth, and he's not yet come down. Oh, my gosh. So he'll sit on his throne in heaven, and those who are lost will go to heaven's realm and see all that could have been theirs. And they'll stand before the great king, and he'll pull out the first book called The Lamb's Book of Life to see if their name's in it. That's the citizenship of heaven. See, it's no different than you being in the United States of America. You have a birth certificate, and we can prove it by government documents you were born of the, if you were born of this nation. If you were not born of this nation, and you are not a legal citizen of the United States, we can prove that as well. Right? And so that Lamb's Book of Life is the citizenship of the kingdom of God. He'll look for their names, and when it's not found, he'll shut that book slide it to the side, and he'll create, pull some other books. Now, these books will be a lot because they are every recorded action of rebellion. His case against the lost is without contesting. Full proof. This is why when I've gone to the prisons before, and I'll even say it to you, I'll go in and I'll say, gentlemen, I am your defense attorney right now. I'm here to get you off of all your crimes. I'm here to get you declared innocent. If you'll only call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. And you'll be acquitted of all your crimes, all of your own doing. Now, that doesn't mean out of their natural crimes and they'll walk out with me today. I'm talking about their spiritual crimes, and that's way more important than their natural crimes. I said, but if you do not, come into the kingdom of God at these words and you continue to resist and never yield, then one day when you die and stand before the Lord, I'll become your prosecuting attorney. For the Lord will reveal the day that I came and declared to you the message of Jesus Christ and you rebelled against saying yes. So you want me as your defense attorney to get off right now because you don't want me as your prosecuting attorney in heaven. Are you hearing me? Yes. Earl Glisson, would you come to the stand? Yes, Lord. Did you on this day preach this message to Putnam Correction Institute in Palaka, Florida? Yes, sir. Did you say these words? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, my. See, it's almost like we've become so religiously brainwashed we have no concept of how the things of God actually work. Yeah. And the reason is, is because there's this cliche statement we keep making called being in Christ and we don't know what it means to be in it, Christ. Being in Christ is saying I'm in the King. My life exists in the king. He's made me royalty. With that being said, turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Look at this. Paul said, To whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Glory is the full weight or measure. If you want to experience the full weight and measure of God, then it must be Christ in you. This is so amazing that once again, most believers are crying out to go be with the Lord in heaven when the Lord is saying, but I live in you. I chose to make you the temple of the Holy Spirit. I chose to come down to you. I chose to come and dwell in you. I came to change you, live in you, instruct you, empower you, deliver you, cause you to be a representative of me in the earth. I made you in Christ and Christ in you. Man, if you'll sell out to this thing, Oh my gosh, your life will be forever changed. 
And it is my passion, just like Paul's, because the passion translation, and we'll jump up a verse to verse 26 and then go down to verse 29, but look what he says concerning this mystery of Christ in you. He says, there is a divine mystery, a secret surprise that has been concealed from the world for generations, but now is being revealed, unfolded, and manifested for every holy believer to experience. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory of his people, and God wants everyone to know it. People don't want to know you're going to heaven. People want to see heaven manifest through you. Christ is our message. The king is our message. He's the king. He's the king. He's the king King is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and bring every person into the full understanding of truth. It has become my inspiration and passion in ministry to labor with a tireless intensity and with his power flowing through me to present to every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus Christ. Oh, if you get the revelation that you have arrived. You're a child of God. You're in a royal family. Did you deserve it? No, but he gave it to you anyway. So quit thinking of yourself in your former manner of life and start seeing yourself as Christ made you. He goes on and says it this way. The latter part, verse of of this particular verse. Oh, that's how it ends there. Let's go to the message translation. The message translation says it this way. It says, the mystery has been kept in dark for a long time, but now it's out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, but to know his rich and glorious secret inside and out, regardless of their background, regardless of their, oh my gosh, of their religious standing. The mystery in a nutshell is this. Christ is in you. So therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That is the substance of our message. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. We preach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to what? Maturity. To be mature is to be basic. Christ. To be basic, what's that mean? The same works that he did, you do. You know what's basic? Basic is this. I can do the same thing Jesus did if I do what Jesus did. That's not dying on the cross. That is dying on your own cross, meaning dying to your flesh and living according to the pattern of God for your life. But it also means living like Jesus did. Jesus said, I don't do anything on my own initiative, but only what I hear the Father say. And if we who are children of God now can be led by the Spirit of God, then we can follow God's Word and do the same types of actions Jesus himself did. Why? Because we are the kings of the king. No more, no less. That's what I'm working so hard at day after day, year after year, doing my best with the energy God so generously gives me. So as your pastor, I'm passionate about you understanding you are in Christ. You're royalty. You are a royal bloodline. You are a holy nation. You are no longer the scum of the earth. You are no longer no good. You are no longer beat down. You're not what your mama said, your daddy said, your grandpa said, your auntie said, your uncle said, what your friend said, what the bully said when you grew up, what that person who abused you said of you, what the devil's been taught and telling you, you are who God says you are. And the only way you're going to operate in it is not because you feel like it, but it's because you believe I am who God says I am. He says I'm more than enough. He says I'm a conqueror. He says that I'll overcome. He says that I have joy. He says that I can walk in his fruits. He says that I will overcome. He says that he'll deliver me out of all my trouble. That's what I am. God made me this way. I refuse to argue with daddy and tell him he got it wrong about me. (sighs) 
I, we have the answer to all humanity's problems. Well, now, Pastor Earl, there's a lot going on in the world. Yeah, because they're in sin. That's why. The only answer is Christ and him crucified and you making him Lord so that you can come out of that junk and get into the kingdom of God. If you want to really deal with the systemic stuff going on, you got to go back to sin. Nobody wants to talk about sin because if you talk about sin, you got to now talk about the Lord because he's the only one who dealt with it. Their religion didn't deal with it, but Jesus did. Jesus settled it once and for all. He took on our sins so we could take on his righteousness. Man. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, 29 says this. He says, for you are all sons of God. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you think that I have an advantage over you, you don't know who you are in Christ. It communicates your illiteracy to the terms of your birthright. You don't know your daddy because you're too busy identifying with your old dad. And your old dad told you you ain't going to mount to nothing. You're never going to make it, son. Daughter, you're never going to be anything. You just trash. You trash. And then the Lord saves you out of that, and you still hear him yelling at you across the fence. You're just trash. Oh, you think you're better now, don't you? You need to look back and say, shut up. I am better. Because he made me better. Jesus don't have garbage kids. Now, he got some garbage thinking kids, but he didn't have garbage kids. Let's look at this in the Passion Translation. For you all become true children of God by the faith of Jesus, the anointed one. It was faith that immersed you into Jesus, the anointed one, and now you are covered and clothed with his anointing. You have the king's anointing. Oh, my gosh. We are no longer see we we and we no longer see each other in our former state, Jew or non-Jew, rich or poor, male or female, because we're all one through our union with Jesus Christ, with no distinction between us. We're twins. And since you have been united to Jesus the Messiah, you are now Abraham's child and inherit all the promises of the kingdom realm. Who inherit it? Who inherit it? Who inherit it? The brown sheep? The black sheep? The white sheep? No, we all do. Because we're identical. Don't call me white. I'm not a white man. I'm a new man. I'm a new man. I'm a new man in Christ. All I am is a new man. And I'm not white anyway. I'm darker than that. It's a good thing I can't get offended because it's highly offensive when you call me white. <laughs> I'm darker than that. And some that are kind of dark, I can catch you. Are you hearing me? Because I don't identify that way. World identifies that way. God never looks at the outward appearance. When the king was going to be anointed, God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse, and he walked in and saw the firstborn son, and he looked like the king saw where the anointing was taken off. And he went to say, surely this is God's anointed. And God stopped him and says, I am not like man. I do not look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. So when you come and identify me outwardly, you're of the devil. You're acting like a mere man. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. God's not colorblind because he's too creative. <laughs> 
but he doesn't look at us that way. He sees us through red. And I'm talking about a red man. I'm talking about blood. All right. Glory to God. Amen. We should sing the song. Let's do it. You ready? Jesus loves a little. Come on. All the of the world. Come on. They are. Jesus. Yeah. So why don't more churches look like ours? The Pantone colors in here are amazing. Did you hear that? Pantone colors. All my creative team just went crazy. My son-in-law did a backflip in the sound booth right now. Pantone colors. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so creative. Oh, well, you look so good. But listen, we have inherited all the promises of the kingdom realm because we're children of God. And I want to close with this one scripture, Luke 12, 32. I want to remind you. So don't ever be afraid. Dearest friends or my family, your loving father joyously gives you his kingdom realm with all its promises. Because you are born in Christ, we have access to the kingdom realm and all of his promises.